I'm Giyuk Shin, uh, director of the Shorin's Time Asia Pacific uh, Research Center here at Stanford. And thank you and welcome all of you for joining us online uh, for today's uh, discussion. So this is the fifth of our four webinar series, uh, Perfect Storm, uh, Climate Change uh, in Asia. So throughout this uh, fall quarter, we will be uh, discuss uh, climate change impacts and risk uh, in the Asia Pacific region, adaptation and mitigation strategies and policy responses. So we have been focusing on specific uh, geographic area or thematic issue. And today I'm very happy to say that uh, we will be uh, discussing uh, climate change issue uh, in South Asia. So the next one will be on Japan uh, next Tuesday, a week from today. And please check uh, our website. So I'm very pleased to uh, introduce my colleague, uh, Aljan uh, Tarapol, uh, who leads our South Asia initiative. So he will introduce our speakers today and moderate the discussions. Uh, thanks again uh, for joining us today and please enjoy. So Arjan. Thank you very much, Georg, and good evening or afternoon, or as Georg said, very early morning to everyone. Uh, we are right now uh, in the midst of COP26, the UN's Climate Change Conference. And uh, while world leaders are discussing their targets and policies, we here wanted to take a deeper dive into one specific part of the world uh, and the environmental challenges that it faces. Uh, that is the Himalaya and the associated mountain ranges known as the roof of the world. Now, mainstream international relations and guilty as charged my work included, uh, looks at this region usually as a zone of security competition between nation states. Uh, it treats the Himalaya just as a locale or as a setting where politics happens. Uh, but in fact, this is an intrinsically important part of the world environment. The mountains are a source of at least 10 major rivers upon which 2 billion or 3 billion people, depending on how you count it, depend. But these rivers and their associated ecosystems and populations are at risk, especially from a frenzy of dam building that has accelerated in recent decades. Now, today at this webinar, we'll take a look at how that infrastructure development creates environmental change and the impact of that change on local populations. Joining us to discuss this are two experts on the region. Uh, I'm really excited because they come at similar problems from different perspectives. Uh, so, they, so we'll together look at these challenges from a couple of different angles. Uh, first, from La Trobe University in Australia, we have Ruth Gamble, who is an environmental, cultural and climate historian of Tibet and the Himalaya. And she is writing right now a book that is a history of one of the one of the region's major rivers, the Brahmaputra, or as it's also known, Yarung Tsangpo. We also have uh, from Kathmandu, uh, Santosh Nepal, who is a water and climate change scientist at the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, or ISIMOD, uh, an intergovernmental organization. Uh, for 15 years, he's been leading research there on the region's hydrology and climate change. Now, you can read more about these world leading experts and their research on our event website. Um, but uh, as always, we've got a lot to get through. So I'll just make one more housekeeping announcement. If you out there in Zoom land have questions, please don't hesitate to share them. Uh, use the Q&A function, not the chat function. Time is short. We are limited to less than one hour now. Uh, so I will be ruthless. So please keep your questions short and to the point. Now let's begin. Uh, I'd like to begin by setting the context of why this region is so important to the climate and ecological well-being of the planet. Uh, so could I ask you, Santosh, 
first. Uh, could you give us an overview, very broad level overview of just how much on this planet depends on the Himalaya? What about the, the major rivers that flow from it? How many people depend upon it? Uh, and what are all the related systems that are tied up in this part of the world? Okay, uh, thank you, Arjun. And uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank you for this, uh, giving this opportunity. Uh, as you already mentioned, uh, the Himalayan region, especially the Hindu Kush Himalayan region, is very important region. Uh, if you look at from the global perspective as well, uh, the region has actually the 240 million people living in the mountains. Uh, but if you look at the other environmental resources that the region is boasting, then you see that the 10 big rivers actually originates from the Himalayan region, including Indus, Ganges. Uh, Brahmaputra, Yarlung Sampur, a few others. And then the people living on these river basins in the downstream, if you look at the numbers, it's coming 1.65. So in total, 1.9 billion people are living in the region. So that's where you can imagine the importance of mountains because mountains is providing uh, you know, the important uh, resources like water resources, ecosystem services to this kind of population. But on the other hand, if you look at the peoples, they are the most vulnerable people because if you look at the poverty index, you know, and that's where these peoples are very vulnerable in terms of the changes happening in the region. Equally important is the Indo-Gangetic plain, if you look at the, uh, which is also considered as the food basket for South Asia and beyond. And that's also the water resources is very important. And not only the water resources, when I call it water resources, that also include the snow and glacier melt water, which is coming. You know? In Indus basins, uh, in the spring season, this more than 50% of water withdrawals is actually attributable to the melt runoff, and that actually supports additional you know, the food production. So in that context, the global, uh, the SKS region is a global asset for food, water, carbon, culture, and biodiversity. And biodiversity is again very important because it's actually, um, it's, a, it's a very important resources. And then there are already hotspots where the biodiversity is already under the pressure. So I'll end with the uh, reminder that the reason's importance is not on, not only on the recent period, but if you look at the historical perspective, you know, if you go like you know 3000 BC back, uh, there were civilization flourishing in these rivers, Indus civilizations or Yellow River civilizations. You know, at that time only four or five big civilizations were happening, including Egypt. So that's where the importance is, you know, the from the very, very long time. Uh, I'll, I'll stop here, Arjun. Yeah, that's great. That's excellent. That's that's a good broad sweep. It, it gives you a good sense of not just how long this has been an important region, but just the scale of, of what we're talking about here. We're, we're talking about a region that is not only intrinsically important for the people who live there, but tenfold important for those who depend quite directly upon it. Now, on the flip side, Ruth, can I ask you to give us a very sort of broad scene setter on what is happening uh, politically or I guess maybe anthropologically, but, but broadly, what are the major states of the region or, or, or also the, the smaller states of the region doing in terms of economic development, in terms of trying to exercise political control? What, what is the political activity that is counterposed to this sort of environmental context? Okay, well, so thanks for having me as well. And I just wanted to start by acknowledging I'm coming to you from Nam in, or otherwise known as Melbourne, the, on the unceded lands of the Wiradjuri people of the Kulin Nation in, in Australia. Um, and yeah, speaking of <coughs> unceded lands, um, I seamlessly move into talking about the Himalaya. Um, I, I find I, I really like uh, Santosh's talk and I'm always happy when people hit, say uh, his introduction. I'm always happy when people bring history into this because I think it's really important to think historically. I usually get into trouble for saying 60 million years, but we can start with, you know, 3000 um, because the Himalaya is 60 million years old. Um, but the, um, there's, there's major states and there's also something that I think is interesting about how we understand the Himalaya. So Santosh is talking about the kind of southern rim of the Tibetan plateau. 
Um, but there's also corners of this um, where you have it, the Himalaya gets into other uh, large river systems. So the, the Yellow Tsampo um, Brahmaputra, which I've been looking at, just right next to that, there's, a, there's one valley over basically, is the Salween River and then the Amikong River and then the Yangtze River. And if you take in to the, into account the scope of those extra rivers and then to the north of the Tibetan Plateau, the Yellow and Yangtze, this really is um the the one of the most important environmental regions hydrological regions on the planet uh yeah and so it's it's really it really key it, the himalaya have played a really key role i would argue in world history um and not just regional history uh, so in terms of the nation states that are currently in charge of stuff yeah um so uh yeah to the north you have the people's republic of china um, who came onto the Tibetan plateau during the 1950s and um, pushed up into the to the mountains around the same time you had the new Republic of India um, pushing up uh, through the mountains in uh, the state of Arunachal Pradesh and Ladakh uh, and then you had these kind of longer mountain communities um, longer kind of mountain kingdoms in uh, Bhutan and Nepal um, and they were mainly in the valleys until that point, but again, once you had a nation state system operating in the area, their remit went further up into the mountains. And then also um, with the partition, you have India and Pakistan. So you end up with like an array of really unsettled borders in regions that weren't really kind of invented for borders, you know. Um, I, so um, I was listening to someone who said that India had this kind of cultural understanding that the Himalaya was their border and in, and in a lot of Chinese discourse you have, hear the same there's this idea of China being between the mountains and the sea right uh, but what happens when you're trying to make a border in those mountains becomes really complicated so you've had a lot of tensions over those areas and then just briefly in terms of um, there's the contested borders but then you also have a different approach to development and environmental protections uh, in China um, there's been a lot of focus on what they're calling clean energy, which is mainly hydropower extraction from the region. Um, and uh, but China has uh, yeah made a lot of commitments to uh, trying to, to move away from fossil fuels as well, and this is having an impact on. So there's kind of a, a kind of a, a, a an argument between which one you protect more the fragile environment or the other one is carbon outputs. Um, Nepal, I think Santosh can probably talk more about that than me. I tended to focus more on India. Bhutan and, and uh, China. Um, India uh, is pushing for development in the Himalaya and, and the um, exploitation of its uh, hydropower resources, but it's way behind China on that. Um, and Bhutan is, uh, Bhutan is really um, pushing hydropower as well and Pakistan with help from China. Does that give you an overview enough or? Yeah. That's, that's an excellent overview. <laughs> and, and, it really, and I really liked how actually, um, the, the 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 way you segued into your comments because you, you I mean when you talk about this as an environmental system we are talking about a many millions of years long history and in that context a several decades long polity and and and, and, and a several years long competition for political control or economic development just seems like yeah. so ephemeral uh, and yet that is what occupies most of our attention most of the time. Um, now, let me flip it back to Santosh. Now, we've set the scene, right? Why uh, the Himalaya is important and what, uh, what, the, what the broad political contours are. Now, let me ask um, again, in turn, first Santosh and then Ruth, can you briefly uh, uh, outline what are the broader environmental trends of concern, right? Santosh, you, you alluded to this when you were talking about glacial melting, etc. But in very broad terms, and we will get to the infrastructure development and the impact of that later, but prior to that, in a broader sense, what, what's happening environmentally uh, that is of concern to this system? Uh, thank you, Ajahn. Um, I, I think this is a very important question in terms of um, what is happening? What are the bigger environmental you know, the changes and trends in the region? Uh, the first and foremost comes to my mind is the, uh, the, the way the climate change is happening uh, in the region. Uh, we have been discussing about the discourse of 1.5 degree, limiting the global warming to 1.5 degree uh, worldwide, you know, 
but we also did the assessment and published uh, uh, HKS assessment report uh, in 2019, looking at the entire environmental aspects of the Indo-Pacific Island region. And, and I'll put the link in the chat section later. Um, and the studies actually indicates that the even 1.5 degree is too hot for the Himalayan region. So when, when the globe is, you know, the one and 1.5 degree, our region is actually one really two degrees, 0 0.5 degree more. So that actually indicates the scale of the problems that we are facing, that it's not equal if you, when you compare it to the global. And there are other factors like you know, the elevation dependent warming, which causes more you know, the warming rate higher in the uh, mountains, you know. And that actually poses a lot of challenges which we have already facing in terms of the way the glaciers is melting in Bhutan and Nepal, you know, in last 30 years, more than 25% of the glacier area is gone. Uh, so what would be the impact on the downstream areas in terms of water values? These are the questions. But if you look at the future, that's even scary. Even if we are able to limit the global warming 1.5 degrees Celsius, we're gonna lose one third of the glaciers for sure. So that means by the end of the century. So one third of the glacier ice will be gone by that time. But if we don't do anything, if there is a business as usual scenarios, then the scenario is that the Himalayan region will lose two third of the glaciers. And that's a huge you know, the, uh, number in terms of the way it is affecting the people in downstreams. And Ruth very nicely elaborated the, you know, the human landscape. The, the, the region actually extends you know, the, from the uh, western sides from Afghanistan to the eastern side in Myanmar in between Afghanistan, Pakistan, China, India, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Myanmar. And 3,500 kilometer stretch, the overall, you know. And that's actually the, affecting the huge number of people who depends on the, uh, you know, the melt runoff and other kind of water resources. And that also includes the disasters, the floods, the way the, you know, the different kind of disasters is happening. And so, um, and then the, uh, the, the, the link that I would like to make is the, the food systems, you know, the food production, the food security, the way it will be impacting the ecosystem services. And that's very, very, uh, you know, the uh, uh, important uh, to understand. Uh, and, but there are other environmental challenges as well. It's like, you know, the, um, uh, when we see the, the broad scale, then we also need to look at the, you know, the, what is happening at the local scales, ground scales, the way the development is happening. Is it environmental friendly? Is it, you know, the, uh, the, the too, too, too much for the biodiversity uh, and other ecosystem services? You know? 70 to 80% of the original habitat in the biodiversity hotspot uh, of the HKS is already gone. And then the uh, one, one, one fourth of the endemic species in Indian, Indian Himalaya could be wiped out by 2100. So that means that the, it's not only the population which is affecting, but also the biodiversity and other ecosystem services. So I'll, I'll, I'll conclude my statement saying that there are you know, the uh, broader changes happening. And then the, I, I see the climate change as the biggest villain uh, in the coming days. Yeah, well, certainly when, when you, when, as you said, when uh, when when the when the ice pack is responsible for fifty percent of the water downstream, um, required, the springtime, and and when those glaciers are going to melt, and uh, then then that's a significant impact. Um, Ruth, can is do you have anything to add on on the impact of these? Just just to give a sense, give a little color on how these broad environmental challenges and, and threats uh, uh, manifest and affect local communities uh, on, on, any, in, on, on any, you know, declared patch of land. How, you know, whether, you, whether mm. if you're a villager on this side of a border or that side of the border, mm. the disappearance of a glacier is going is, is, is to be the same. Yeah. But how, how are yeah. local communities being affected? It's, it's interesting. Um, I keep having this idea at the moment of trying to think of humans as a species, right? Because uh, I was thinking about what um, Santosh was saying about the different uh, species that live there. And if you thought, where do humans live? 
it's in the Himalayan watershed, right? We're river creatures. We cling to places with uh, um, uh, river systems that are perennial. Um, and this uh, combination of a monsoon and a glacier uh, enables a perennial river system. And so there's no wonder that this area has been a place of human habitat for so long and is now like sustaining, you know, almost half the world's population if you take it all the way from Beijing around to Afghanistan. Um, so, you, so when you say lo local people, in some ways the local people here are half the world's population almost, right? But then um, you're also dealing with uh, really big disparities between uh, large population centres on the plains below the mountains and much smaller population centres uh, in the mountains. And what you often get happening, and, and, I, and, I, and for me it's fascinating because I'm a historian, so I've been looking at how the, what happened when the British came into this area and then noticing the way they talked about things and their maps about extracting energy or extracting uh, things from the mountains. And I'm seeing the same maps with the lowland countries and the way that they approach uh, Tibet and the Himalaya. It's like, okay, what can we get from here? You know what I mean? Like, uh, what, where's the water? What, where's the minerals that we can get from here and take to the larger cities on the plains, right? So if you're talking about like the locals as in half of humanity, that's a big deal and, we, and the world should be paying more attention to that. Um, but then there's also these uh, local communities in the mountains that are sidelined uh, most of the time particularly by RIR people, but we won't hold that against you, Azan, um, because, they're, because they keep talking about this as a discussion between China and India, which is a big deal, right? That's a big, big story. Um, but uh, that kind of, like, even the maps, I've noticed a lot of the maps, they just have like a blank with no mountains in them. This is China, this is India, uh, and their entities, like, um, I think my boss, Nick Bisley, talks about it as being pool balls that bounce into each other that don't have anything between them. That's not it. This is the mountains. These are vibrant places with such a multitude of communities, such a multitude of ethnic, ethnic groups, and people who have learned to live in these spaces over thousands of years and have cared for them, right? the custodians of the land across this area that are being profoundly affected by um, fast development, extraction, along with these threat multipliers of climate change and then uh, biodiversity loss. And it's almost as if that kind of cultural conservation and biodiversity loss at the moment are being played up against um, the, the, the uh, things that you can extract, extract from the area to help um, China, India particularly, but also to a lesser extent, Pakistan, Nepal and Bhutan um, transition uh, from uh, carbon intensive economies to uh, car less carbon, uh, but with higher hydropower um, inputs. So I don't know, the people are kind of squeezed, right? They're, 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 they're caught up in a bigger drama that's like probably the biggest drama on the planet and, and their local stories are often uh, over, overridden or ignored in that process. Yeah. Have I depressed you enough? Yeah. <laughs> That's, I mean, that's, I mean, especially when you're talking about half of humanity, right? That's, that's, this is not, these are, these are not small villages that are, that are easily forgotten. This is, this is a, a big deal that cascades, there's going to be a lot of bad puns, but the, this is a big deal that's going to cascade downstream a lot. Um, and in fact, you, 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 you brought up the, the link perfectly, because I want to now delve more into this uh, this issue of e either this extractive model or this idea of trying to develop uh, more hydropower, which on one level should be, should be um, uh, 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 prima facie sounds good because it's a renewable energy resource, right? But on the other hand, um, the, the idea of large dams is for good reason uh, been discarded or gone out of fashion at least. Uh, in the developed world. So Ruth, this is something that you've written about, um, this, this sort of competitive dam building uh, race uh, that especially India and China are engaged in. So at a time when big dams uh, have fallen out of favor, why can you explain a little bit more why India and China are so determined to build so many of these? It's kind of like a, um, a, a cascade of coincidences to um, uh, combine a few metaphors. Um, so the so historical coincidences. So you have this, um, the, like I said, the India and China are old civilizations uh, and, and centers of human history, but new countries. Uh, and uh, what you had happen is that they came of age during the time of the um, 
the uh, the Cold War, and both um, and they became like sites of competition between uh, the uh, two blocks of the uh, capitalist and communist countries, um, saying we can help you develop, right? And one of the things that they were sold is the idea of dams. Now, so you had uh, America come in on the back of their Tennessee Water Authority and develop um, the Indus Valley um, and help uh, and come to a deal between Pakistan and India to uh, enable that um, the development of the Indus Valley's hydropower to go ahead. And you also had Russia helping uh, the United States, sorry, the Uni Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, um, helping China in the start um, to develop its, its uh, water capacity. But it kind of got stalled on both ends uh, through the 80s and uh, 70s and 80s. And in the 90s, you had big protests against dams, particularly in India, um, uh, with the Namada River protests. And that led up to a big project uh, in, through, the, through the 90s. Uh, there was so much anti-dam protest all around the place um, that the, uh, there was a World Commission on Dams that decided that they were a zero net gain for humanity. And this meant that from then on, most of the developed world stopped producing large dams and in fact started taking them down. Right? They could see the effect that it was having on the environment and they decided there were better ways um, to mitigate floods, get irrigation and pr produce hydropower. And particularly there was a movement to like micro hydro projects, which could work really well, I think, in the Himalaya, but probably Sam Swash knows more about that than me. Right. So then that's on the one well, on the one hand. But as this was happening, China kind of missed the memo and just kept going right so at the same time as the um as the uh the, the world commission on dams was bringing out its report it was building the uh, the three gorges dam uh and then it became this i think that uh, and uh, i have a friend rohan de Souza who's written about this in terms of the british influence on india that once you set up an industry and the infrastructure in order to produce dams, they kind of keep tending to produce themselves. So if you've got 2000 people who are trained to build dams, they want jobs building dams. Yeah. And if you've got um, people doing this assessment and, and also you also have this idea like um, China's approach as coming from the kind of communist model, but then developing on it is this idea of adding on. Let's add more. Let's add more. Increase the times. And it has like five year runs of, uh, of development, um, whereas the kind of mountain time to use a phrase that I often hear in the mountains in a different way is more like 50 years, 100 years cycles. Uh, the uh, state cycle is every five years, we need to do more and more and more and more. And so the combination of those two, the industry and the planned economy have helped lead to this race in uh, dam building. And then you have this kind of reactive response from India, where it's like, if China's doing it, we're going to do it too, basically. Um, uh, and uh, uh, but then I don't want to be completely harsh because both countries are trying very hard to develop fast and to improve the living standards of their people and they really need energy. So you kind of get this buy off between uh, how do you do things in a clean way and how do you do things in a, a, a biodiversity, biodiverse, how do you do things in a way that's going to help biodiversity and uh, hydro um, and help aquatic bio, bio systems? Yes, I think that's right. That's excellent, and and once again, a, a, a perfect segue. So we've got we've got this um, uh, uh, immovable object, or, or I should say, this irresistible force. Santosh, can you describe the immovable object upon which it is colliding? Which is what what is the impact of these uh, big dam projects on biodiversity and on 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 sustainability in this region? Um, what when we, when we talk about the dangers of these big dams, what are we talking about? What is the environmental change that is being triggered by them? Yeah, Arshan, uh, again, very important questions. And uh, let me a little bit, you know, the unbundle the questions, you know, that the, the, you're talking about the big dams. Um, and there are, you know, on the counter, there are other small dams maybe also, you know. Uh, why the, what and I'll call it like more in a, in a neutral term water storage, you know, in my conversation, you know, and it could be the reservoir, or water storage reservoirs, or dams, or big dams, or small dams, or micro that uh, Ruth was also indicating. <laughs> so, if you look at the um, ecological context of the region, then you have uh, we have this, you know, the too much and too little water. So in the monsoon time, it receives like 80% of the rainfall. And that applies 
mostly on the southern Himalaya sites. So just take that example of the trees. You know. And then 80% of the, uh, you know, the rainfall comes during the monsoon season from June to September. And if you look at the larger context of the Himalayan region, that can extend by a few weeks or months here and there, you know. And then the 20% of the rainfall actually comes only during the eight months. So we are actually on the one hand, it's like, you know, the, our, our leg is dipped into the too much water and the other side is the too little water. And you cannot balance this saying that I'm an everything, you know. Imagine that your one leg is in the heart and the other one leg is in the eyes. Can I say that, well, on average, I have like you know, the five degrees. Right? So that's not the case. So, so water storage is also very important from that perspective that it regulates the water. So you can actually keep water during the flood time and use that water during the uh, dry seasons for energy production, for food production, you know. And I was looking at, uh, before the conversation, the number of dams. I, I, I don't know, I had a very quick, you know, the Google search and which indicates that, you know, around 5,000 dams in India, but in United States, there are 84,000 dams, uh, which is like, and if you look at the dots, you know, that's more on the Eastern coast and then the quite a quite number of dams. And, and every country has dams, except probably Nepal. Nepal has only one reservoir hydropower, you know, and then the second one can be built. The, the question is, I think the, um, uh, the water storage facilities are very important for the region. The question is whether they are environmental friendly or not. Uh, in the context that we have a very young mountain system, young in the sense that Ruth, I think the, you're, you're uh, indicating the 65 million years the mountains were building, you know, that uh, on, on our geological terms is still young. You know, and which is very fragile, you know, the, the, the different is concerned. So whether the environmental aspects, the downstream, you know, the requirement, the aquatic flow, because down the um, uh, down the, the you know the reservoir there are aquatic ecosystems, biodiversity, and all those kind of things, and they are equally important the uh, you know the for irrigations. Whether that has been taken into account is the is the big question, and in that way you can say that whether the you know the water resources facilities were built in a more environmental and sustainable way. Or they were only taking considerations of their one, uh, you know, the only on their own facilities, and and then the, putting all the negative externalities to the public. You know? And that's what they. I'll again uh, pick up the example from Nepal. We have these hydropower, so not exactly the dams, but they are like you know the water divers and kind of things. You know, and we are so deprived of you know the uh, the, the the energies that uh, in the dry seasons, uh, even during all the time you have to maintain certain environmental flow downstream so that the aquatic ecosystems and other kind of you know, the water requirements are taken into account. But that we rarely see is so this is actually affecting the um, environmental flow. You know? the, the, um, and, and, and you have these questions about you know, what upstreams and downstream impacts, you know, the, the, as well impacts as well as the, whether the things, you know, the requirements were taken into account or not. The second uh, part, which I will end, uh, is the you know the the eight countries that ten rivers originating from this, and all these rivers are transboundary in nature. So that means that rivers flow from one rivers to the uh, one countries to the second countries, and then in some cases the third countries. You know? And uh, um, so water is again here is the water security, you know, and that's again like uh, it's not only the water, if there is a conflict between the two countries and Ruth has given a very nice example of industry between India and Pakistan, I think World Bank played a very important role for that. And then the, the two countries were able to negotiate and come to a kind of you know, the consensus on the uh, on buildings and operating the entire river systems. So, um, you know, if there is like, you know, the conflict on the water sharing uh, between the upstream and downstream nations, uh, that can be a big issue. And then the big issues in the sense that you see the big nations, you know, and if there is a conflict and that can be a very, very, uh, you know, the catastrophic uh, in nature. So, so um, it, in that way, I think the somewhere I'm also highlighting the importance of water resources facilities. Uh, but the question is that whether they are built in a more environmental and sustainable way. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. It's not. It's not a. It's not such a black and white issue. But um, let me maybe maybe one thing that 
can illustrate this is, um, is one example of a proposed dam that I've read about. Uh, and in fact, in fact, I read a few months ago a story, a, a press report in ABC News Australia, uh, where Ruth, you were quoted as saying it's nuts in reference to this proposed project. Um, so that's a great quote, first of all. But secondly, this is a project to uh, build a hydropower, um, uh, well, you can explain it, but to build um, infrastructure at what is called often the Great Bend of the Brahmaputra. Ruth, can you explain what this nuts idea is about? <clears throat> yes. Um, yes, they liked that quote. Um, and, and when I said that, I, I don't just mean it, it like Tibetans have this expression, send me chub, which means my head can't get around it, right? And that's actually more about what I meant. Like my head, when I sit down and start thinking this, I was like, wait, what? Um, yeah, and I've become this like aficionado of um, hydro industry magazines kind of and websites that come out in China. Uh, trying to understand what they make because they haven't actually made a final decision on the way that they're going to approach this um, this infrastructure um, but it is really intense so basically what you have is the um, Yalong Sample River um, it comes across the Tibetan plateau goes through the largest canyon in the makes a massive turn almost like um, 90 degrees or more than 90 degrees actually and because it comes back on itself through the world's largest um, a gorge uh, or canyon and uh, it drops from around uh, 3,000 metres at the entrance, 3,000 metres above sea level to around 600 metres above sea level at the end and that's in a really short amount of time. So it is this, the area on the planet with the greatest potential for hydropower uh, anywhere. And so uh, there's been this kind of like we have this idea in dam history, which is a thing about zombie dams. Like someone will mention, oh, we need a dam here. And then people will go, no, 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 that's just bananas. And then um, then it'll pass away. And then 10 years later, well, the first time this was mentioned that there could be a dam on this bend was in the 90s. And then they were saying that they could use nuclear weapons to blow it up so that they could get the dam into place. So yeah, and people going, no, no, that's not cool. Um, and so that was kind of put to the side, but then it gets rolled out every 10 years. And people kept talking about this dam on the Allen Sample Bend. And I kept thinking this isn't gonna happen. And then it was in last year's five-year plan um, in the section that, uh, that, they were, that the Chinese government was saying, we're gonna do this in the next five years. They had um, exploit the hydropower from the lower reaches of the Yellow Sample in a, the same section as um, send a mission to Mars um, and develop high tech. So it was in that idea of this is like a technological stretch that we will reach for. And it's then after that, it's like a, a moonshot. Moon yeah, exactly. It was the, 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 the equivalent of going to the moon, but in hydropower terms. Uh, and so then the Power China people came out and said that they were talking in, in talks to develop this potential and it would be two to three times as much a hydropower capacity as Three Gorges Dam. Yeah, um, so that gives you the scale of it. But then it's like, how do you do it? Because this region, as San Tosh has been wonderfully saying, and I have to say every time San Tosh talks about his work, I'm like, so glad you exist because it's so important, right? Um, but the, uh, this, like, this region, because it drops from so high to so low, is also one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. Um, and uh, they are still finding whole mammals there, right? That we've never met before in terms of um, contemporary science. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is, and this doesn't usually get talked about, but I'm going to make sure we try and emphasize it, is that this is all, there's different ethnic groups living in this area. Um, the Tibetans consider it a sacred site and the place that they were talking about, um, it, it's, it's like the body of a goddess, um, Dorje Pakmo, and the area that they were just describing as being the site of this large hydropower uh, project is exactly on her heart chakra, which is not cool. Um, and then there's also other, indi other indigenous groups in the area, the Adi, Loba, who have really strong ties to this area and ancestral ties, and none of their voices are actually getting put into this discussion. 
Um, so yeah, so, so you have biodiversity, you have indigenous connections to the land, um, but then you also have on the other side, this massive potential for hydropower. Um, so I don't know how they're going to do it. One, one, one suggestion I saw in one of the hydro magazines was to drill this was the one I was like, that's just nuts. It was to drill a tunnel because um, Santosh was talking about the smaller versions of this, uh, where you drill a tunnel underneath, divert the water, it drops down and creates hydropower. But this was building a tunnel underneath um, Namchipawa, which is a 7,700 metre high mountain. <laughs> so I'm, my voice is squeaking thinking about this. Um, and uh, um, using tunneling and uh, tunneling, tunneling technology to go underneath it so the water would drop down underneath it. Um, yes. And uh, uh, yeah, and uh, the, it was fascinating because there was also uh, an idea about putting a road through there. So I don't quite know how that's going to happen. But yeah, it was, it, it's a, uh, um, in order to be able to pull it off, if they can pull it off, it's going to be one of the biggest engineering feats in history but then I should also say as well as thinking I'm kind of uh, um semi cap like my mind can't get around it it's also this is where the Assam earthquake of 1950 that's like almost the exact um spot is in that area uh where it uh it how it occurred so why would you do that so uh, the, yeah so oh, as well as biodiversity and how you can pull it off in terms of engineering I think that idea of starting to think in mountain time as in what is the geological cycles of this area and you know how how is this how can we start thinking in like earth time as well as political time and five-year plans is really important when we look at this project yeah and that's and that's such a that's that's such an important um issue because we uh, again we're all of these all of these political entities and even you know a human's lifespan is the blink of an eye when we're when we're talking about as you say mountain time but you also raised when you're talking about this uh crazy moonshot idea you also alluded to you know the three gorges dam as a point of comparison and i remember when that was proposed and under construction, the uh, uh, concern that was so often mentioned was the concern of a disaster, right? So we've been talking so far, um, Santosh has been sort of expounding on the sort of slow motion environmental degradation that we've, that, that we're witnessing as a result of infrastructure, but also everything else. But what's astonishing in, in the scale of this ambition is correspondingly an astonishing scale of potential disaster right so santosh can i ask you when we're talking about uh environmental change and environmental risks uh can you outline not just what are the sort of slow evolving or i guess relatively slow but actually rapid evolving environmental challenges but also what is the risk here not only of this one project but generally of this infrastructure development what are the risks of, of disasters, specific sort of sudden uh, catastrophes uh, that would affect both the environment, but also the people downstream? Yeah, uh, Arshan, uh, yeah, I, I think you're, you're raising a very important aspects of sudden catastrophic kind of disasters, which is very important, you know, and then the, uh, the way we see the nature of the hazards is also changing. That's we have observed, uh, particularly this year, the uh, you know the the extremes kind of disasters we are seeing. Um, I am I'm, I'm not really experts on the dams things like you know the what could be the catastrophic kind of disasters uh, could happen, but I can generally guess that you know, the, the the instability of the uh, dams if sudden you know. Uh, things happen that could like you know frost out huge amount of water to the downstream that could be one i could think you know uh, but there are other environmental issues it could be important in the inundation areas like you know, the, uh, if the geological area is unstable you know, the things can fall and that could also be quite catastrophic um so i i may not be able to answer fully your question but i will I'll, I'll try to bring one aspect, the climate change, into the you know the uh, discussion that uh, things are changing unprecedented way uh, under climate change, and that we have already started observing 
and particularly this year, extreme rainfall uh, is happening. And that's something like uh, the, um, the infrastructure that we have built with the current understanding of the hydrological cycle, rainfall regime, you know, that probably is changing in the future. And that's what we also did some studies in the region that, you know, the 50 year flood, you know, the flood magnitude which occurs, you know, in the 50 year interval of time, uh, that could double in some of the tributaries in the regions, you know, or 50 to 100 percent kind of increase on the magnitude, um, on the climate change towards the end of the century. So the question is that the, whether our understanding of the present, uh, you know, the climate, it's sufficient in terms of the, the way the few climate change is happening in future. This year, particularly in Nepal, we have seen so many stations which are indicating, you know, the extreme rainfall within 24 hours time, you know, exceeding 100 millimeters. And there was one particular station, uh, you know, which was indicating more than 400 millimeter of precipitation, you know, that the, uh, if, you, if you look at that in the standard of European, you know, the uh, precipitation, in, for example, in Germany, so maybe 50% of the rainfall, in, in, even in the R standard, in where we just received, you know, the, the, the intensity of rainfall, which is one, fourth of the entire year, you know. And uh, this could uh, have a serious implications because, um, and that also reminds us that we need to build our infrastructures in a more climate friendly way, you know, and that could be one thing that we can already start thinking. And there was a second point which I wanted to indicate um, in terms of, uh, you know, the catastrophic damage also related to climate change, but somehow I, I forget and I'll, I'll try to bring that. Uh, ah, well, I, I remember. I, I mentioned to you that there is a one um, uh, reservoir in Nepal, which is producing, I think, 36 megawatt of hydropower. In 1993, we had a huge, um, you know, the extreme rainfall, uh, which is again at the scale of 400 millimeter of rainfall in 24 hours. You know, remember and that actually brought huge amount of sediments and which actually fill the reservoir capacities by one fourth. You know, that the, the that means that the, in one day, your reservoir is already filled the capacity of you know, the 25%. So that kind of extreme phenomenon uh, is, is very important for this kind of dams. And the, the, the one, the things that I'm trying to alarming you is that the, it's not our fault that we, uh, that we are building our infrastructures only by considering the present hydrological cycle. But it's now time to think that when you build your infrastructures, you need to also uh, include the, you know, the how the climate will be changing in the future. So you can already start building the, they call it the climate proof, you know, the kind of infrastructure. Not, not, not your full answer, uh, Arjun, but I try to partly answer. No, that's, that's great because I'm gonna, I'm gonna press you on, on that very point again, because, and, and I wanna ask both of you this, this one question that how do you, and, and I, I sort of alluded to this earlier as well, and you just alluded to it now, there seems to be multiple values conflicting against each other, right? There seems to be a trade-off that is necessary here between on the one hand, preserving environmental stability, avoiding disasters and avoiding hazardous change. But on the other hand, there is, again, as people are discussing in Glasgow right now, there is also an urgency to develop uh, renewable sources of energy. Uh, and as, as you mentioned, Ruth, uh, you know, a pressing political and economic need to develop economically to to lift people out of poverty so how do you is there a way and this is the last question i'll ask before we, we conclude with some before i ask you to really reach out on some policy recommendation but at this point is there uh technically or politically and maybe the answer is different for those two a way to reconcile this trade-off between the need for renewables and, and economic development on the one hand, and the need to um, um, uh, 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 behave in an environmentally sensitive and sustainable way. Is there a way to square that circle? 
technically, Santosh and then Ruth. Uh, Ajahn, there is no black and white answer for these questions because uh, again, the question, the answer lies how the dams are being, you know, the plan to build and what sort of uh, importance that we want to keep, you know. But it and is given, possible again, what you're saying. You're saying it is possible to do it in in a way that reconciles. Yeah, of, of course, of course. Then, 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 then the question is that the big dam versus the small dams, you know. And then the, the, the question is again, like, do, do you want to build the hydropowers, for example, in every tributary that you have the opportunity because you get this, you know, the vertical height that Ruth was indicating is a part of the um, hydropower development, or you want to keep some tributaries intact or the main trunk in, intact so that there are other kinds of activities can be uh, done, like the, the, the sports activities, rafting and things like that, you know. Uh, but the question is also the need for the nations, like, you know, I, I don't know if you are familiar with the word load setting. Does it come to your vocabulary, load setting? Yeah, it, it doesn't come to your vocabulary. It, it's actually the blackout. And every kid in Nepal knows the black, black you know, the load setting because in, in time, three, three or four years back, we used to have 16 hours of, you know, the, uh, uh, the load shedding, you know, that because we didn't have, we, we have this 43, thousand megawatt hydropower potential in Nepal, but uh, only 2% of this being harnessed. And uh, that is not sufficient during the peak hour of the electricity demand. So that's how uh, the authorities need to divide the uh, remaining electricity to the different parts in the specialist scales. So we used to sometimes we used to deprive of the, even to recharge our mobile phones, you know. And, that, and that's the thing that even in, in your vocabulary, this, the word, the load setting is, doesn't exist. And every kid in the palm is the load setting. You know, that, that, that's, so the, what is the need? I think that, that's the very important question because now we know that the energy is so important that even if you have taken the pictures from the space, if you have seen these NASA fancy pictures, which is taken the night time, you know, that these, these cities with the electricity, that's not only the city. That's also the resources, you know, that they, that also you can actually attribute to that, uh, to even to, uh, you know, the how the resources are being uh, flourished, how the economic activities are happening. And we used to have a joke like, you know, the, even the, if the NASA was taking the picture, the entire Nepal was like blackout because sometimes uh, the, during the clicking time, you, you don't have that, uh, you know, the electricity. So the need, I, I'll, you know, the put it very bluntly that, you know, the, the, what is the need, you know? Uh, when the basic needs are fulfilled, uh, then we can think of in you know, a more, you know, the sustainable way. But I'm not telling that you go and build the very large in that you know, your economy is not supporting that as a huge impact. That's not my, you know, the indications, but I'm trying to indicate there are, uh, you know, the alternative ways were large versus small, you know, keeping some tributaries intact. And these kind of discussions can always happen. Oh, that's great. That's great. And, and, and Ruth, I will, I will ask you, and I'll also pile on, mindful that we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, I didn't, I didn't um, initially get what you were saying, Santosh, but I, we just recently moved to California where there is, where load sharing is most definitely part of the vocabulary here uh, for, <laughs> for very different reasons, I think. Um, Ruth, I want to ask you that sort of question about how do you reconcile the differing uh, interests, perhaps more from a political perspective, perspectives but also um i want to ask you to answer the, the last question here and then santosh I'll, I'll give you a chance to answer it as well when we talk about uh crafting sustainable solutions to these problems um, and mitigating the risk of, of environmental damage um what do we need or or maybe more precisely what level of politics carries the greatest burden here? Are we talking about sort of uh, local level or national level um, initiatives? Are we talking about bilateral political agreements, multilateral agreements, and, and bringing it back to where we started, COP26 is underway right now. Obviously, you know, a, f a fully comprehensive uh, program requires everything, but perhaps another way of asking it is where is, uh, the greatest potential, un, so far unrealized potential for political work to help reconcile these issues. 
at what level of government? Um, I, so I, I'm a dual Australian Irish citizen. I'm going to speak as an Irish person here because I'm so ashamed of my government at the moment. I don't think we should be making any comments about international stuff ever. Um, <laughs> right. So, but anyway, um, putting that aside, um, it's a really complicated question. There's, uh, and I do think like I, I've always, I've been amazed by how well South Asia has picked up on mobile to phone technology. Right. And I think that there is a there's a there's an analogy to be made about how it can skip all the bad technology and, and go for cutting edge um, uh, uh, sustainable technology in development in throughout the mountains. Right. And, and with the use of water, like Santosh says, small dams, hydro, you know, flexible. I've seen things where you have like a floating turbine that you can put in the river at some times of the year and then take out. Um, when, when it's not suitable, right? So there's amazing stuff that we can already do. But there's a couple of things going on here internationally. And this is big picture, right? Um, it keeps striking me. I'm watching COP as well. And my bad prime minister is that, um, that, that uh, there is kind of an international uh, version of what people talk about in terms of sociology when you have a really big disparity in a certain region, there is no one is healthy. Yeah, there's, there's, there's too much tension between the, because the, the wealth is disproportionately given out. And I think this is totally what we're seeing here. So we really need international um, changes that will allow for uh, this kind of trend, like the transfer of technology. So I keep thinking like in terms of health, we have um, COVID vaccines and we've, and we've been arguing that they shouldn't have any copyright on them. There shouldn't be any intellectual property uh, uh, um, agreements about it. Um, this should be the same for new technology that would help Nepal uh, and uh, Bhutan and these regions, right? There shouldn't be any uh, resistance to tra technology transfer because this is like survival. So you know, a few extra bucks isn't gonna help us if we're dead or extinct. Um, and so, so moving things in, in into this area that are really helpful and high end tech would be really helpful. Yeah. And in terms of so that's an international thing, we just need to get rid of that because they're not helpful. But there's also a really big issue here, because like I said it back beforehand, this is an area that is kind of being governed intensely and administered intensely for the first time by outside actors. Yeah, like China and India have these historical arguments about who has what or whatever. They weren't in the mountains. Yeah, they were like sending people in every so often. So that new administration there means that um, they really are trying to figure out what they're doing. And the way that they talk about it is so much like the British, it's really scary. So, so there's a kind of a, you know, we're colonizing the mountains in a way. So trying to bring in um, in between, like there's good, I'd say there's things you can do good locally, um, but there's no kind of recognition that these lowland states are coming into that area with an extractive, exploitive lens. And I really don't know if you can get to a stage where you have, and this might be controversial, I don't know if you can get to a stage where you have good development in the mountains until there's recognition on both India and China's part for a start that they are extracting from a frontier. Yeah. I really don't know if it's going to work. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Santosh, I know you have to you have to run. I just want to give you uh, uh, the last word, give you a chance to, 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 to say anything that has been left unsaid. Yeah. Um, thank you, Arjun. I still have five minutes. Uh, I, I, I think what you're trying to highlight is the sustainable solutions and then the more at the, you know, the policy levels and also relating to this uh, ongoing COP. I think uh, de definitely, we need to, uh, you know, they strive for the sustainable solutions. There is no alternative for that. Um, and then while doing so, I think what we also need to look at the, uh, understand the cumulative impact, you know, not just look at the one component of the systems, you know, that whether it's energy or dams or any other thing, but also look at the cumulative impact, you know, what is happening and also try to understand this compounding risk, not only in the present time, but what we're gonna face because once you build the infrastructure, this is not for one or two years, it could be, you know, the 50 years or 100 years. So that, that's very important. And I, I saw this one question, it's very important on the chat section is the, uh, what about the earthquake? Ex 
very important you know if you if you're gonna go and build the uh, hydropower in the you know earthquake fault zone uh, that's gonna be catastrophic in the future so that's not, no denial on that um, and 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 again like you know to minimize the negative externalities uh, to the you know the uh, on the, on the common goods that uh, the way we see you know the especially in india nepal like you know, the, the, all the industrial pollutants pollutions are directly you know, the, as um, flushing to the rivers that actually is gonna uh, problematic and here i would like to high, really highlight the especially in the hindu kush himalayan regions and then the um, and our, 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 our institution isimod is really promoting and regional cooperation for transform the rivers you know and on on the two fronts very clearly is that the how can we minimize the risk in this transboundary rivers of like floods or any other kind of risk and also equally is the how can we maximize the benefits we had these excellent examples from 1960 in indus you know the treaty and how the indus is flourishing in terms of food production in the region so there, there are already good examples that we really need to uh, you know the um, try to replicate in other regions um this this uh, the cop cop 26 is happening and i just like to talk about is that the uh, for the himalayan regions the adaptation discourse is very very important you know and then for this uh, there is a cost associated with this that's where the climate financing is very important to resolve some of these you know the pertinent issues that we have discussed uh, that can improve the livelihood of the people mountain communities that can help for the resilient development you know uh, and the um, uh, and especially in the mountain context in the Hindu Himalayan region and the people living in the mountains, uh, special attention is required for the mountains, which is under great pressures. And uh, Ishimod is kind of uh, advocating that the, the protecting the mountain environment in the state region. And we have uh, you know, the number of programs going on and co. Uh, and uh, we are also trying to bring and advocating the, uh, you know, the, the Himalayan regions into the global mountain you know, the discussions. And that can probably help us. So, um, uh, so I, I'll stop here. And thanks for the opportunity as well. Thank, thank you, thank, thank you, Santosh, and thank you so much, Ruth. The, this was this was really, really interesting. Um, I feel like we only just touched on it. Um, the, there's there's a lot to take away. I really uh, found quite quite profound your points uh, that you initially raised, Ruth. But I think you both hit on it in multiple times about how just the different conceptions of time make such a difference that our planning cycle and our political cycle is so out of sync with with the with the with the cycle of the earth um, and also just how interconnected everything is right how we're not just we're obviously talking most directly about land and aquatic ecosystems but also biodiversity we're also talking about energy security we're also talking about environmental, uh, correction, economic development. We're also talking about ethnic diversity. We're talking about indigenous voices. We're talking about political conflict and war. There's so much wrapped up in all of this. Um, and I think you guys did a terrific job of, of drawing out a lot of it. So thank you very much. Um, and, and I wish us all globally as a species the best of luck. <laughs>